This is a tough video to make because part of me really likes the Brotherhood of Steel. I love the art. I love the military culture. I love the vehicles and the weapons and the armor that they have. There is so much about the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 4 that is so cool and that I want to love. But the Brotherhood of Steel is evil and I'm gonna prove it to you. Now the very nature of this video means that I'm going to be going through some major, major plot spoilers. If you have not finished the major plot of Fallout 4, turn back now. Lots of plot spoilers ahead, you have been warned. Now before we get into the details, let's talk about the fundamental problem with Arthur Maxson's Brotherhood of Steel. The fundamental problem with the Brotherhood of Steel is their fanatical worldview about human purity. This is best summed up by a line we find in Proctor Quinlan's terminal. When talking about Arthur Maxson, he describes Arthur Maxson as the perfect human specimen, an example of everything a human being can achieve. Let's pull this sentence out and change one word. Let's see how uncomfortable we can get here. The perfect Aryan specimen. Does this remind you of anything? Bethesda clearly modeled the narrow philosophy of the Brotherhood of Steel on bigoted worldviews from the past. The Brotherhood of Steel refuses to allow anyone who isn't human into their ranks, and worse than that, they have declared war on sentient beings who are unhuman, including super mutants, non-feral ghouls, and Gen 3 synths. Beneath the Commonwealth, there is a cancer. Known as the Institute, they call their creation the Synth. A robotic abomination of technology that is free-thinking and masquerades as a human being. This notion that a machine could be granted free will is not only offensive, but horribly dangerous. Therefore, the Institute and their synths are considered enemies of the Brotherhood of Steel and should be dealt with swiftly and mercilessly. Take a look over there. That's Fort Strong. And it's infested with super mutants. Having those aberrations of nature close enough to smell is making me sick to my stomach. Super mutants? I thought the enemy was the Institute. Super mutants are no better than sense. They're a reminder of man's folly when it comes to harnessing technology. As members of the Brotherhood, it's our sworn duty to exterminate these abominations in every form. Now, in our real world, there's nothing wrong with the idea of human exceptionalism, in my opinion. Until alien races are proved to exist, humanity really is the pinnacle of animal life in the universe. There are no creatures on Earth that come close to what humanity is, and so there's really nothing bigoted or unethical about talking about human exceptionalism. But in the world of Fallout 4, where there are sentient super mutants like Virgil in the Glowing Seas and Erickson in Far Harbor, where there are intelligent non-feral ghouls like Hancock, Daisy, and slews of others, and where there are peaceful, intelligent Gen 3 synths that are indistinguishable from humanity like Glory, Magnolia, Sturges, Curie, and slews of others. Talking about human exceptionalism at the expense of all other types of beings is exclusive and it's bigoted. It truly becomes evil when as a faction you vow to annihilate those groups of people. Note that I said people, not human. This goes back to my video on our Gen 3 synths people. In this game, I think a sentient being can be a person. It can have personhood without necessarily being human. I want to reiterate that I do not think that's true in the real world. I think only humans can be people. I don't think animals are people. I don't think robots are people. In the real world, only humans are people. But in this fantasy world, I think that it's very clear that according to lore, there are non-human creatures in this world that are indeed people. This fundamental ideological problem with the Brotherhood of Steel is the source of their evilness and it's the source of their weakness. This ideology, it makes them weaker as a faction, it makes them unethical, and it turns them into a ruler over the people of the Commonwealth instead 
of a servant, as every good government should be. Now that said, there are still some great and wonderful people that are in the Brotherhood of Steel. Scribe Halen is an excellent example. She has amazing human character qualities, and she's willing to stand against the Brotherhood of Steel when she believes that they are doing something wrong. She's the only person to come to Paladin Dance's defense when he gets in trouble. I can't believe that after everything Paladin Dance did for you, you're just gonna turn your back on him like this. Dance? is the most selfless person I've ever met. I've watched him risk his own life based on nothing more than principle alone. That's why I'm asking you, not just as a member of the Brotherhood, but as a human being, give him a chance. And there are many other people in the Brotherhood that are just like Scribe Halen. So when I say that the entire faction of the Brotherhood of Steel is evil, I'm not saying that each individual person in the Brotherhood is necessarily evil, because I don't think that's true. And I echoed a similar sentiment when I talked about how the Institute is evil. I don't believe all of the Institute scientists are evil. I think there are some honest, hardworking, good people who love their families and love other people who work for the Institute. And similarly, I think there are some honest, hardworking soldiers of the Brotherhood of Steel that just want to make a living and then want to go back home to see their families someday. They are not evil. But a faction is the sum of its parts, and a whole lot of good people banding together under an unethical banner create a dangerous faction that can do some very evil things. Now, when talking about the Brotherhood of Steel, we must make sure that we are differentiating Maxon's Brotherhood from the Brotherhood of Steel that we find in Fallout 3. The Brotherhood of Fallout 3 is completely different. The Brotherhood in Fallout 3 was led by Elder Lyons. He had a different worldview from that of Arthur Maxon. In fact, Elder Lyons' Brotherhood of Steel from Fallout 3 is different from the versions of the Brotherhood of Steel that we find in any other game. It is the deviating factor. It is the thing that is unusual. We learn from Paladin Dance that Arthur Maxon's Brotherhood of Steel sees the Brotherhood as it was under Elder Lyons as having gone astray. A decade ago, the Brotherhood had almost gone completely astray. The Elder before Maxon sent us down a path that was leading nowhere. He was more concerned about charity than the preservation of technology. But when Maxon took over, he single-handedly reprioritized the Brotherhood from the ground up and put us back on the path to glory. The reason for this is because Elder Lyons put the people of the Capital Wastelands first. He wanted them to have access to free, healthy drinking water. And so he used the power and the assets of the Brotherhood of Steel to help as many people on the Capital Wastelands as he could. And that's a very good thing. That is the Brotherhood of Steel we knew in Fallout 3, when Elder Lyons died and his daughter, Sarah Lyons took over, she followed in her father's footsteps. Now, there were some consequences to this. There was a splinter faction of the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 3 that left the Brotherhood because they felt that Elder Lyons had strayed too far away from the Brotherhood's core goal, which was keeping technology out of the hands of other people and hoarding it for themselves. They called themselves the Outcasts. These Outcasts were actually Brotherhood of Steel members that had an ideal that was closest to the original Brotherhood of Steel ideology. When Sarah Lyons was killed in battle, Arthur Maxon was still a child. We learned from Quinlan's terminal that the East Coast chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel went through one ineffectual leader after another until Arthur Maxon grew to the age of 16. At that time, he proved himself to the elders of the Brotherhood of Steel by single-handedly slaying a Deathclaw, which is how he got his awesome face scar, by killing two raiders that attacked his squadron, and by killing a super mutant leader named Shepard that was trying to reorganize the super mutants in the Capital Wastelands. The elders of the Brotherhood of Steel on the West Coast heard about Arthur Maxon's feats and appointed him elder of the Brotherhood of Steel on the East Coast. At that time, the outcasts who left under Elder Lion's leadership came back into the fold. Arthur Maxon was successful at reuniting the Brotherhood of Steel, but in order to do so, he had to abandon the ideals of both Elder Lyons and his daughter Sarah Lyons, and instead re-embrace the ideology of human exclusivity at the expense of all other sentient beings. Now, Arthur Maxon did change things a little bit. He doesn't hoard technology quite as much as is typical with the Brotherhood of Steel. We learned this from Quinlan's terminal. He's perfectly fine seeing other people using technology as long 
long as that use of technology helps the Brotherhood of Steel. This is why he allows you, the sole survivor, to run around in power armor and Gatling lasers doing all of your little side quests even before you become a sentinel of the Brotherhood of Steel. His ideology on technology has relaxed a little bit, but his view of the world considering other beings aside from humanity has not. And that is the real problem. This philosophical difference between Maxon and his Brotherhood of Steel and the Brotherhood of Steel found in Fallout 3 under Elder Lions was a source of controversy among the Brotherhood of Steel soldiers for many decades. There were people who were uncomfortable with the outcasts coming back into the fold of the Brotherhood of Steel. There were people who were uncomfortable with the idea of Arthur Maxon leading the Brotherhood of Steel at such a young age. But it appears that by the time the Pridwin reaches the Commonwealth, most of these concerns have been settled, either by expulsion from the Brotherhood by anyone who disagreed with Arthur Maxon or by those people changing their minds. We learn a little bit about this struggle in a holotip we find on the Pridwin named Maxon Was Right. You know, before getting shipped to the Commonwealth, I thought Elder Lion still had some good points. The Brotherhood in the Capital Wasteland, they were about helping. But this assignment, it's opened my eyes. On the flight here, we passed city after city buildings taller than I've ever seen, some that nearly clipped the Pridwin. And who uses them now? Mutants. Freaks. Seeing all that destruction, tens of millions dead, brought on by technology run amok, it made it so clear. Elder Maxon is right. The wasteland needs to be cleansed, and we're the ones to do it. Now, it's not entirely necessary, in my opinion, for the Brotherhood to be so exclusive about what kinds of sentient beings it allows into its ranks. There's already a chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel that allows non-humans to be Brotherhood members. The Midwest Brotherhood of Steel, which operates around the Chicago area, has a wide range of sentient creatures within its factions, including super mutants, sentient ghouls, and even sentient death claws. The Midwest Brotherhood of Steel was introduced to us in Fallout Tactics. There are some people who question whether or not the events of Fallout Tactics are canon, but the events of Fallout Tactics are mentioned in every Fallout game since. They are mentioned in Fallout 3 and they are mentioned in Fallout 4. If you talk with Captain Kells, he mentions the Brotherhood of Steel Zeppelin fleet that crashed near Chicago. Did the Brotherhood ever build other airships? There were less advanced versions of the ship built on the west coast a long time ago. Historical records about their current status are in dispute, but we're fairly certain that they were destroyed. The survivors became the Midwest chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel. So we know that it's possible for the Brotherhood to stay the Brotherhood while still allowing non-human people within its ranks, without making war on anyone who doesn't look exactly like them. And this species exclusivity makes them weaker. That is one of the major things I want to prove with this video. As awesome and as powerful as the Brotherhood of Steel is, their ideology makes them weaker as a faction. This is most clearly evidenced with the entire drama surrounding Paladin Dance. I covered this in a separate video called Blind Betrayal. But in short, the Brotherhood learns from some data that the sole survivor finds in the Institute that Paladin Dance is really a synth. And Arthur Maxon's response to that is to order you to execute Paladin Dance. Dance is a synth. He represents everything we hate. A monstrosity of technology. I'm ordering you to hunt down Dance and execute him. Flesh is flesh. Machine is machine. The two were never meant to intertwine. By attempting to play God, the Institute has taken the sanctity of human life and corrupted it beyond After measure. After all I've done for the Brotherhood, all the blood I've spilled in our name, how can you say that about You're me? the physical embodiment of what we hate most. Technology that's gone too far. It's true. I was built within the confines of a laboratory, but when I saw my brothers dying at my feet, I felt sorrow. When I defeated an enemy of the Brotherhood, I felt pride. And when I heard your speech about saving the Commonwealth, I felt hope. Don't you understand? I thought I was human, Arthur. I don't intend to debate this any longer. You simply should not exist. Now there's no question. Paladin Dance is an honest, die-hard member of the Brotherhood of Steel. Advic... Victorium, sister. Arthur Maxon himself even refers to Paladin Dance as one of his most notable officers. Seeing as he's one of my most respected field officers, you couldn't get a better recommendation. 
In fact, the only reason the Brotherhood of Steel is in Boston to begin with is because Paladin Dance and his recon team discovered the Institute and gave the Brotherhood the evidence of synths that they needed to come to Boston. Dance is a core member of the Brotherhood of Steel. His loss makes them greatly weaker as a faction. They lose out on leadership, they lose out of intimate knowledge of the Commonwealth, and they lose a capable, tough soldier. How many intelligent, strong, wonderful people have the Brotherhood refused to allow into their ranks just because they were sentient ghouls, just because they were sentient, non-violent super mutants. How much opportunity to really make their faction dominant on the landscape have they turned away because of their strict ideology? That ideology does not make them stronger. It makes them a weaker faction. They are also weaker because this ideology causes them to focus on too many enemies at once. We all know the wisdom of Winston Churchill when he said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Even if you have some differing opinions with some of the other factions in the game, it's stupid, just plain stupid, to make war on all of the factions at the same time. But that's what the Brotherhood does. The Brotherhood attacks the railroad headquarters first. The only reason Desdemona and her railroad agents have to attack the Pridwin is because the Brotherhood of Steel raid the railroad headquarters and kill Glory. The Brotherhood of Steel does this all at the same time that they're trying to destroy the Institute. That is not smart, but they're forced to do it because it's part of their ideology. The railroad is saving synths, and synths are abominations, therefore the railroad must be destroyed. I also want to prove that the Brotherhood of Steel is not for the Commonwealth. On multiple occasions when we explore the Pridwin, we hear officers of the Brotherhood of Steel say that they have the best intentions in mind, that they really do care about the people of the Commonwealth. This is actually the very first thing that Arthur Maxson says when you meet him. I care about them, you know. The people of the Commonwealth. And it almost sounds trite, almost like he's trying to convince you that he really does care about them. But I have no reason to think that Arthur's a liar. I don't think he's a dishonest man. I think he's a very honest individual. I think that in his mind, he thinks that he's really there to serve the people of the Commonwealth. And it's clear that if you talk with some of the other officers, they feel the same way. Proctor Quinlan echoes the same sentiment when you finally defeat the Institute. Your actions have proven to the people of the Commonwealth that the Brotherhood of Steel has their best interests in mind. The problem is that they only care about the Commonwealth in the same way that a monarch cares about his subjects. That's how Arthur Maxson sees himself and the Brotherhood of Steel. They see themselves as rulers over the Commonwealth. The people of the Commonwealth are there to be exploited by the Brotherhood of Steel. The people of the Commonwealth are there to serve the Brotherhood of Steel, not the other way around. This is most clearly evidenced when we talk with Proctor Teigen and we start his side quests. The food stores don't replenish themselves, so I need legs on the ground to hit up farms in the area. We'll be requisitioning a portion of their harvest, and I need that food crated and ready to go for when I send out a collection team. Your mission will be to ensure full cooperation of the civilian farmers by any means necessary. You get to make sure those farmers down below donate a proper amount of their crop to the Brotherhood of Steel. You get their cooperation by any means necessary. Now, when I've mentioned this side quest in the past, I've had some viewers say, well, this side quest was just coming from Proctor Teigen. It wasn't on the books. It wasn't officially part of Brotherhood business, but I don't think that that is true. When you ask him if it's official Brotherhood business, he says yes and no, but he does say, Yes. Of course, if you're just looking to make a few caps on the side, I might have some extra work for you to do. Caps on the side, huh? Doesn't sound like official military business to me. Well, it is, and it isn't. It's complicated. It just involves a little bit of heavy lifting and interacting with the local farms. I think it's very clear that the Brotherhood knows exactly what's going on. If you ask him if you're going to get in trouble with the Brotherhood for doing this, he clearly says no. As long as I don't end up in the brig. Don't worry. Last thing I'd want to do is get our newest recruit in trouble. Proctor Teigen is asking you to be a raider. He's sending you into the Commonwealth to raid farms of their food. You know, I think I heard of you. Some big shot with the Brotherhood of Steel, right? They ain't that different from a raider gang, you ask me. Just try and act all legitimate, but they still just take what they want. 
and he tells you to do it by any means necessary. You're not giving people an option, you're taking their food. Any means necessary? You're giving me carte blanche on this. You said it. Like they say, if you aren't with us, you're against us. Indeed, when you go to one of the settlements that he sends you to, you have two options to coerce the farmers of their food, both requiring that you pass yellow speech checks. Why do I get the impression I don't want to hear what you have to say? The Brotherhood needs your help to protect the Commonwealth. Donate a portion of your crops to the Brotherhood, and it will not be forgotten. I'm sorry, but we already lost all our stores to raiders. If we gave up our next harvest, we'd starve. The Brotherhood of Steel demands your tribute, citizen. You will hand over a portion of your crops to the Brotherhood. Tribute my ass. We don't owe you anything, so get off my land. The outcome of either choice is exactly the same. The farmer feels coerced. They're not doing so because they love the Brotherhood. They're not doing so out of their own free will. They're doing so because they're scared and they don't want to be killed. Donate a portion of your crops to the Brotherhood and it will not be forgotten. Hmm. It doesn't sound like we have much choice. We'll contribute our crops. You will hand over a portion of your crops to the Brotherhood. You'll get what you want. Just please don't hurt us. The only option you have to get this food legitimately is if you fail all of those speech checks, leaving your last resort the option to buy the food from the farmers. But they ask for a thousand caps. What would you take for your crops? Hmm. Now there's a question I don't get every day. I can't see parting with our crops for less than a thousand caps. Deal. Fine, you'll get it when we harvest. No deal. Suppose we're done here then. Considering you only get 100 caps as a reward for this quest, how many of us are gonna actually pay a thousand caps to get this food from the farmers ethically? Now you can pass a yellow speech check to negotiate this down to 500 caps. How about 500 caps? <sighs> I'm gonna regret this, but okay. But that's still 500 caps that you're spending. Regardless, yes, it is possible to complete this quest ethically. You can legitimately buy the food from the farmer and then deliver it to the Brotherhood. But my point is that this capitalistic transaction option isn't even mentioned by Proctor Teagan. Buying the food never crosses his mind. He clearly wants you to confiscate the food, and he expresses great disdain for the people of the Commonwealth. Here's the farm. I've no doubt you'll convince those simple little civilians. If these farmers realize what we did for them on a daily basis, they'd be lining up to help. He talks about them as puny pawns that need to be moved around the board, as ungrateful subjects who don't realize how good they have it with the Brotherhood trying to look out for them. And it's very easy to say that this is just a problem with Proctor Teagan, but it's not. It's a problem with everybody. Talk to Proctor Quinlan and he expresses the very same sentiment. If you choose the very rare ending where you leave the Brotherhood, the Railroad, and the Minutemen alive, killing only the Institute, the only way to do so is to have the Minutemen take out the Institute. If you choose that option, Proctor Quinlan praises you and says that he thinks that it's inspired that you use the Minutemen basically as meat shields. You deserve all the accolades you've been receiving and more. And despite popular opinion on this vessel, I feel that using the Minutemen to accomplish this feat was an inspired concept. You've minimized the Brotherhood's potential casualties by coercing another force, using them as virtual cannon fodder. Inspired. <sighs> Sometimes I feel the Brotherhood has such a narrow view when executing its operations. The Minutemen are a Commonwealth militia. Quinlan is saying that it's a greater thing that so many Commonwealth citizens died instead of Brotherhood soldiers. You know what he would have said if he really had the best interests of the Commonwealth in mind? He would have said, Sole Survivor, why did you send all of these non-professional soldiers into the Institute? You should have come to us. We're a professional army. We have the best armor and equipment. We could have done it faster and with fewer human losses. That's what he would have said if he truly cared about people. But he doesn't. He's a member of the Brotherhood of Steel. They don't truly care about the citizens of the Commonwealth. They only care about them in as much as those Commonwealth citizens can help the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood has a monarch subject relationship with the Commonwealth. It sees settlers as subjects that need to be ruled and exploited when necessary for the sake of the Brotherhood. And when any of those settlers rebel, when any of those people have viewpoints that are contrary to the Brotherhood of Steel's ideology, then they must be destroyed.
What may be the absolute worst thing that the Brotherhood did is mentioned in passing in one of the terminals. We learn from Arthur Maxon's terminal that Proctor Ingram needed a better fusion plant in order to get the Pridwin to move fast enough to come to the Commonwealth. To do so, they harvested a fusion plant from the wreckage of an aircraft carrier. Now, it's possible they could have found almost any aircraft carrier just lying around, but what's the most likely explanation? Well, the Pridwin was built in the Capital Wasteland at the Adams Air Force Base, which is the closest aircraft carrier to the Adams Air Force Base. None other than Rivet City. Rivet City is a crumbling aircraft carrier, but it's also a city. It's a town filled with people. That fusion plant is giving electricity, light, and warmth to dozens, maybe hundreds of people who are living in Rivet City. We learn from this terminal entry that because the Brotherhood needed it, and the Brotherhood's needs reign supreme, the Brotherhood simply went to Rivet City took their fusion plant and put it in the Prid one. I'm pretty sure the people at Rivet City didn't just bend over and say, sure guys, take what you need. They probably resisted. And you know what happens when people resist the Brotherhood? They disappear. What we're looking at here is a scenario where Arthur Maxon and his Brotherhood of Steel completely wiped out everyone at Rivet City just because they needed an updated fusion reactor that would get them to Boston faster. That is the heart and soul of the Brotherhood of Steel. They want to tell me that they've got the best interests of the Commonwealth in mind, that they really do care about these people? Bullcrap. They care about themselves. They care about their ideology. They care about their own ambitions and their own plans, and they use people simply as tools to achieve their goals. They only care about people in as much as those people can help them achieve their vision. This is the great evil of having a fanatical cause, ladies and gentlemen. It allows you to justify atrocities all in the name of the cause. Yes, we killed everyone at Rivet City to get their fusion reactor, but it helped the cause. Yeah, we had to murder a paladin dance, but you know what? It helped the cause. Sure, we're stealing food from farmers, food that these farmers need to live. They're gonna die if they don't eat it themselves, but you know what? It's helping the cause. Now, some viewers have said, well, you know what, Oxhorn? Despite their evils, the Brotherhood is still the best hope for humanity. And you know what? That's a legitimate argument. This is, after all, a nuclear wasteland. We can't expect perfect morality. We can't expect perfect ethics. People are just struggling to survive, so maybe we should just embrace the rulers that we get. But I don't think that the Brotherhood is the best hope for the Commonwealth, for the same reasons that I don't think the Institute is the best hope for the Commonwealth. Yes, the Brotherhood has great technology. They really do. They are the only ones who dominate the skies. That air superiority cannot be questioned. They are the only ones manufacturing power armor. This gives them a nearly unlimited supply of power armor, which greatly improves their fighting force. But they make some very stupid decisions, and their ideology makes them weak. Those two things make them so weak that I can't see them as the best hope for the Commonwealth. First of all, they put their headquarters in a blimp, which is the key to their downfall. In every single ending that defeats the Brotherhood of Steel, they're defeated because they blew up the blimp. That's not smart. You're hovering in the air with a bunch of hydrogen-filled bladders, and Proctor Ingram makes it clear in some of her terminal entries that the Pridwin is suffering from a coolant issue, which means that they may not even be able to leave the Boston airport. So you've got your headquarters in this potentially crippled blimp that is extremely vulnerable to any enemy that can target it from afar or that can infiltrate it from inside. That's not very smart. And their ideology does not make friends, it makes enemies with every single faction of the game. I don't care how powerful you are, if you're making enemies at every turn, you're not going to be around for very long. That's a failure of basic diplomacy. Yes, the Brotherhood has amazing technology, and yes, they have an organized hierarchy already in place that allows them to respond quickly. But none of these things actually help the people of the Commonwealth. And I can't sit here and say that any faction is humanity's best hope if they don't have humanity in mind. The Institute doesn't have humanity in mind. This was one of my major criticisms of the Institute when I talked about them and why they are evil. Their ideology is mankind redefined. They're trying to redefine mankind. 
And how are they doing that? By destroying the mankind we already know and replacing it with Gen 3 synths. This is why X688 talks about how he can't wait for the surface dwellers to die out. He doesn't have humanity's best interests in mind, he has the Institute's best interests in mind. The Brotherhood of Steel is the exact same. They don't care how many farmers have to starve to death to give crops to the Brotherhood so that the Brotherhood can have meals. All they're concerned with is the Brotherhood, the Brotherhood's goals, the Brotherhood's ideologies, and defeating the Brotherhood's enemies. They don't care how many settlers they have to kill, how many farms they have to raise, how many families they have to crush to get that done. They are not humanity's best hope. They are their own best hope. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I struggled with this video for a long time because one of my favorite characters is my Brotherhood of Steel character. I love the Pridwin. I just love the technology behind it. I love power armor. I love how it works in the game. It's just such a fun faction to play with, and I want to like them so much, especially after playing Fallout 3. The Brotherhood in Fallout 3 is very different. They actually serve the people of the Capital Wasteland. But the Brotherhood of Fallout 4 does not, and it appears that the Brotherhood of Fallout 4 is closer in ideology to the Brotherhood as a whole. The Elders on the West Coast specifically appointed Arthur Maxon to be Elder of the Brotherhood on the East Coast because he united the East Coast Brotherhood of Steel and brought the outcasts back. Despite all of the things that I like about them, I must conclude that they're unethical, that their ideology makes them weaker, that they don't have the needs of the Commonwealth in mind with any of the decisions that they make, that they are not humanity's best hope, and that ultimately, at the end of the day, they are evil. But that is one man's humble opinion, ladies and gentlemen, and I can't wait to read the comments because I am sure there's going to be quite a bit of controversial discussions going on. Do you agree with me, ladies and gentlemen? What do you think about the Brotherhood of Steel? Can you overlook the things that they have done? Do you think that they are justified in doing the things that they have done? Let me know in the comments below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. If you'd like to join the Oxford Oxhorn community on Discord so that you can talk about this topic amongst like-minded individuals, click on the Discord invitation link in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private subscriber-only channel on my Discord server as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video today. Thank you for watching and be sure sure to tune in tomorrow morning, bright and early, when I'll publish my next video. I'll see you then.